We have a treat for everyone today. Um, that's bringing in Trader Vic, Victor Sparandio, one of the market wizards. He's featured in the new market wizards. Uh, one of the guys who put together multiple years of over 100% returns, calling countless market bottoms and market tops, uh, trading all markets, anything liquid from all over the world. Uh, one of my favorite traders of all time, writer of a couple amazing books, uh, Methods of a Wall Street Master and Principles of Speculation. I'd highly recommend those books. Uh, we had a little bit of trouble with his uh, video, so I had to come in and kind of cut the video. So this is the only time you'll be able to see my pretty face. I'm very sorry about that. Um, but this interview has some really pivotal parts in it. Some of my favorites being him talking about some of his past experiences trading, um, emotional discipline, and why it's so important in trading. Uh, also, the ability to just say you're wrong and get out of positions. Um, I found I found that I was a little bit nervous at the beginning of the interview talking to Trader Vic. He is, you know, you really save those feelings for some of the best of the best sometimes, and. He's, in my eyes, he's probably one of the best traders to ever live. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy this interview. It's been phenomenal getting to talk to him, and I hope everybody enjoys it. Uh, I use this from you all the time. It's uh, the pursuit of superior returns. And, you know, you starting off at a certain point, getting to that point, using things like options after a certain point in the year. <clears throat> So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about certain times where you know you you bring out you brought up a great story before about options um, and you using them too short dated. This is one thing we have a lot of a lot of new traders have a lot of trouble with is taking thinking you can time it so well, but also you know knowing that sometimes that it's just not going to work out perfectly. So I think your story of that illustrates that better than just about anything I've ever heard. So if you wouldn't mind going kind of through how you came up with that method to create the uh, pursuit of superior returns and then possibly getting into your option story. Okay, well, the, there, those are two different principles per se, meaning the, the superior returns you achieve by first making consistency, right? And the goal is you don't want to be out of business, right? So it's... <laughs> Preservation of capital, consistency, and then when you've accumulated some con some profits through consistently consistency, you then can be a little bit more aggressive or a lot more aggressive to pursue your superior returns. But if you try, you know, if you if you try to pursue superior returns without a, without some cushion, mm -hmm. and you lose, you can wind up being out of the game and the key is to always be in the game uh, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. So the, the pursuit comes from first saying, well, I'm going to show I can win consistently and then you'll develop confidence if that's the case. And then you can be much more aggressive in increasing your size to get those superior returns. See, it's just a logical sequence, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, the options, see, again, I, I, I have an option. I have a book two. I had a whole chapter on options, and I have lots of option stories, but I'm not sure I know the one you're referring to, the one you're thinking of. So when you, you go long the world, you actually you think you, you actually say this. Uh, you, go, you went long okay. the world, um, and basically your, uh, the timing for this was a little bit shorter. Uh, your expirations were shorter than the timeline you feel like you yeah. should have used. I, I, I think that, again, this is a learning experience. And hmm. <clears throat> I was – this was in the early 70s, I believe. I mean, you – Again, I have a lot of stories, so this one is vivid in my mind because it was a big play. But in the 70s, the early 70s, <clears throat> I had my own company, Ragnar Option Corp. And uh, we basically uh, were short. I was short in that period in 71, 72, oh, excuse me, 73 and 74. And um, did very, very well. And you come into the end of the year. <clears throat> and I was a big Dow theory advocate, which is in the books. And it, it worked really well in those days. And 
all the way up until probably the the 90s, the early 90s. But in any respect, <clears throat> uh, there was a rally in August, and then the the sell off came into by memory December. I think it was December the sixth of seventy four, and there was a divergence, and the volume dried up. Classic. If you no doubt theory, you know, and Robert Ray is the guy I learned it from through his books. And it was a perfect buy. Perfect. So on the day of the low, literally the day, which I believe was was December the 6th, I think it was, by memory. So I went along the January calls in size. Again, I had had a cushion. We were short all year. Uh, mainly it was the Nixon issue. You know, that we were in a recession and Nixon was being impeached or going to be impeached. So I, I really went along, as I said, as I'll repeat the world. Now, what happened was <clears throat> the I remember buying just one one position was Eastman Kodak, and which was 80 at the time. <clears throat> And I think the stock was 70 when I bought these 80 January calls. And, you know, I bought hundreds of them and I bought them across the board. I mean, I owned everything. And sure enough, it took a long time, meaning there was a, a delay of this huge rally coming up. But I did buy the low. But what happened was those Eastman Kodak calls lapsed at 79 ish in that range a week later they were in the 90s so it, it was it, it it told me that when you're buying options uh and you 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 let's say you're right you you need some time so you can't be perfect you should not try to be perfect now of course some people will be perfect by getting inside information <laughs> but if you're trading and you're 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 honestly just playing off of indicators, the tape, you know your your sense, you you should be buying call options that go out at least two months and probably three, and you'll make a little less. You won't get the same leverage kick if you don't buy as many. I mean, those the Eastman Codex could have been a hundred dollars. I don't remember what they cost. But and you could have bought the two months out for two and a quarter or two fifty, let's say. Yeah. Uh, you would have made a lot more. You know, what it would have been a much bigger success. Now I had still had a winning year. Now I'm in January the following year. Completely different thing. Of course, it's early in the year, and some of those you know mark to market there, there they weren't. They didn't get marked down uh, as much. So I still had some mark to market losses. But the key there was I, I called the low of the, of the 70s, 80s, the rest of this century, <laughs> and basically I didn't make a lot of money because I didn't buy enough time. So that was a real lesson. Yeah, that that's that's a, a phenomenal story, you know, and and I I know everybody has done it, you know. It's one of those things that you you when you when you start trading, let's be honest, you start to think you know some shit, and the market likes to teach you that you you really don't know everything sometimes. And I've done that just like you have, and and then listening to your story, I you know I didn't really put it together what I really did wrong the first time I did it, um, and then listening to your story was really helpful for me. And I know there's a lot of newer traders that you know they they i mean god they'll do it a week out you know and and be like i can't believe i got this wrong you know? it's like you know exactly what you said it's it's uh you just want to give yourself that extra bit of time to get it right and that's going to help you really make that big return right right and, and timing timing and options is not a good idea because you really have to be perfectly right or generally right Mm -hmm. But you also need to 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 make the velocity of what you're buying in this example mm -hmm. move up uh, quickly. And options are really for low risk and 
to use as leverage. I mean, that's why you buy options, limited risk and leverage. Mm -hmm. So they're not for timing. You see, as opposed to, you know, I buy a breakout or something and, and, uh, you know, the market moves up. It's a timing play. It's not a leverage play. It's not a, uh, a low risk play per se. Well, it is a low risk play, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a leverage play. So, if I make a mistake, I lose a little and I go on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Options, you're, you're, you're looking to make big money, but you're not looking to make big money per se, timing things. Yes. You're looking to be right, right? Yeah, great point, great point. Um, and then the next one I was kind of getting to those is, is also interesting in uh, the books and, and everybody in the room has definitely read the books. Um, but you talk a lot about emotional discipline and, you know, the, the number one rule, uh, you think of the chapter is called 50 ways to lose money, trade with a plan and stick to it being rule one. And, you know, and after my years of trading, and that's nowhere near the amount of years you've been trading. The one thing that you see is that there's many, sure, there's many ways to trade, but the one thing that you'll see across all good traders is that discipline factor, um, so if you could name, you know, you, you worked with all these traders, um, and you've also trained traders. And so your insight probably comes a lot from that, I'd assume. So what's, uh, what, what did you really notice was when, w- when would it be a time for a trader to just basically say, I need to hang it up and walk away? Um, or when was a time where you saw somebody go, May, you thought maybe they should hang it up, but they actually did turn it around and become disciplined. Well, let me just preface, if you're going to replay this for your colleagues, it is the hardest thing for most people to do mm-hmm. is to set a plan in advance of what you're going to do under certain conditions and to stick by that plan. That's the hardest thing. And when I, train these traders uh, by memory there were 39 people <clears throat> and I trained them all the same way and you can train them give them knowledge so knowledge is really secondary because if you give people the same knowledge and only five people made money by the way and the other ones would blow out blow up and you know they'd be effectively mission impossible you know they'd be fired yeah, you, got, you give you somebody capital and say, okay, you've got X and X depends on your experience and, you know, who you were, some young traders, you know, maybe it was as low in the, in the eighties as 25,000 mm-hmm. trading futures <clears throat> uh, on the floor. And some of the more, let's say experienced block traders, I give them to 50 mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you, you, sort of give the more experienced ones a little more is generally what I did. Not that that mattered because they could lose just as easily as the younger traders. But the key was that if you want to win in this business, you have to have the discipline to say, okay, um, uh, you know, I'm buying silver at, at 22 and I'm going to sell it at 22 and three, uh, 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 21 and three quarters. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm using an example here. Yes. So, so if you do that and you do that all the time and you pre plan what you're doing, now you'll get whipped some more. Mm. Who cares? The key is you're never going to take the big hit if the goal is to be in business, right? Now, there are plenty yes. of people that made fortunes here that you, you, you not using those kinds of disciplines, <laughs> yeah. but, the, but, but the point is there are many that blew out too, right? Yes. I mean, if you bought Bitcoin at a thousand and you held it, you, you know, maybe you, if you depending on how many bought, but you probably made millions. Mm-hmm. The key is, and let's say you had no discipline, you, you can make money doing that, but as a professional, If it's the way you make a living, the theory is you want to be in business. You can't trade if you're not in business. If you blow out, it's a lot harder to raise money if you've you've lost all your money. 
Yes. Right? It's a lot harder to go raise money because you've already demonstrated you, you lost it all. Yes. So the key is once you accumulate it, the key is to be in the game. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a basic principle. The emotional discipline is much harder than the knowledge. You can teach people knowledge. The key is they don't follow it. You know, they, they, they're too attached to the, I don't want to lose, or it's going to come back or who cares? Who yeah. cares if it comes back? <laughs> it's a whipsaw. It doesn't mean anything. You're sitting at your desk, you're in the business and you'll make money the next time around, you know, the next trade or you'll catch a big event. You know, if I had that, by the way, you know, Warren Buffett made all his money by buying effectively the same, the same price levels, the, the December lows in the markets in the Dow at that time <clears throat> was, was uh, more important than the S&P. And he just, that was lucky. You know, he just yeah. went in at the right time. But the key is, you know, he became, you know, one of the richest men in the world by having a plan. Now, I have, I have a lot of criticism of, of, of Warren Buffett in some arenas. Same. But the thing is, he had a plan. He stuck to the plan. Mm -hmm. And that is really, the plan works. He's an investor. He believes the market's going to take him out. You know, the, the politician, he doesn't say this, but politicians uh, save the day. You know, the Fed <laughs> saves the day. Yeah. So, but, but he had a plan. So you have to have a plan. You have to stick to the plan. Great. That was wonder well said, well said. Um, and there was one one part of, and um, it might have been New Market Wizards where you talk about uh, people hiring people with PhDs and stuff to to trade. And you t I think you talk about the fact that they um, they they think so highly of themselves that it's hard to be a trader and just sit your plan and say, well, I'm wrong and, and get out sometimes, uh, you know, just, I don't want to say the names of these people, but it was, it was an interesting one that happened to me not too long ago, which was two PhDs trying to charge a car. Uh, one guy's a surgeon uh, <laughs> and they're both sitting there on the side of the road and they, they want to charge a car. They bring the one car over. They decide that red must go to black, you know, and, and I, I went to automotive school. Uh, and automotive <laughs> school, you know, we, we went through tons and tons of kids who, you know, the first day we'd come in, that's what we'd all do. And so going through all these kids, never one of them ever did that. He ends up hooking it up. He blows up his battery. You know, it's, it's just hilarious because, you know, it, it just sometimes they make it so overcomplicated. So it's really that was a very interesting uh, thing you brought up that was in New Market Wizards just to kind of add to that. Uh, well, just to embellish on that story, just a tad, the point is usually these very bright people, IQ-wise. Mm. My assistant who just left, who's been with me since the 70s, he's got a genius IQ, mm. but he can't make a, a dime trade. Now, the reason is, if you ask this guy anything, he knows the answer. Whatever yeah. it is, you can ask him because he reads and he's got a photographic memories per se. Mm -hmm. So these PhDs using them as, you know, high IQ, very learned people, they are right so often about so many things that they develop a very high self-esteem of, of themselves, which is fine. That's, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But in trading, you could go and you can do research and spend months. Let's say you, I'm going to use an example in the automotive business. You think, uh, you know, there's a recovery coming. The car companies are going to come back. There's going to be, you know, a, a whole new buying spree of automobiles. So you go through this and you spend two months as a researcher doing this. And you've mm -hmm. got this, you're, you're a fundamental driver like a Warren Buffett type. And you, you come to this conclusion, you go long. So now here you are along the auto stocks you've researched, and you're sure as rain that this is going to happen. Now something, and here comes the, the, the point, something has changed. Something somewhere in the world has changed, but you don't know that change. 
because you can't know everything that's going on in the world that's hidden from you. So all of a sudden, the markets go the other way. <clears throat> and you're, if you don't have a strategy to exit, which most of the people don't, they spend two months saying, okay, I've researched this. I know this is going to happen. They, they don't have, uh, the, let's say, the emotional discipline to say, whatever I did, I was wrong. Or in this example, which is mostly the case, something changed, but you don't know it's changed. So you hang on to that position. Tiger did this, you know, the Tiger Funds. Yes. Um, <clears throat> he, I think he bought U.S. Airlines, if I wasn't mistaken. It's, I think it was an airline. It was an airline that he got murdered in it. And he had it from like 80 down to 20 or 15. You see, something changed. That's why I say you, you have to have some methodology. Yes. Basically says, I buy here. The reason is not even as important. Okay. <laughs> yes. You've come to a conclusion. You got, but w w where are you wrong to not put you out of business? Absolutely. That's the critical answer. Absolutely. Uh, and that kind of leads me to the, the next one, which is some, something I talk about a lot, which is, you know, probably five years ago, I stopped really, uh, and you talked about it in your book, and I didn't even get it at the time, which is you, it's a chapter called How Important Can Anchovies Be? Uh, and where you talk about the fact that there's all these very interesting analysts and they say all these very important, wise things, uh, but you don't pay any attention to it. And I was wondering, you know, if you could elaborate on that a little bit for uh, everybody out here, because that's such an interesting uh, point. And to me, I completely agree. But I know a lot of people think I, I, I'm just kind of crazy for, for thinking that way because that's where they get all their information. They're going to put on trades based on that. And I don't think that it works that way for me either. Um, so I was wondering, what was your uh, point? Well, that? That, uh, what, what was the point of the anchovy story? Yes. Just to go over it a little bit. What, oh, what, okay. What, well, the, the point there is the Japanese buy uh, or they, they use anchovies to feed their animals, their livestock, etc. Yeah. So the point was that there was, if the tide changes and these anchovy, you know, they swim in huge monstrous packs, you know, fish, mm -hmm. and they get dragged out into the Pacific. This is off Chile. Well, what do they do? They got to feed their livestock. So they go buy soybeans. So if the tide changes, <clears throat> which you're really not going to know, per se, you, maybe if you, you can hire people to tell you that, but I mean, nobody thinks that way. Yeah. So all of a sudden, they don't catch enough anchovies. They miss that catch because the tide changes. So they go buy soybeans. Now, the, the point is that if you knew the tide change, you go buy soybeans. Right. So you, yes. you'd have a you'd have a great trade in soybeans because of a shift in the tide in the Pacific Ocean off Chile. I mean, you see, th there's a lot, <laughs> a lot of information. My, my point about that story, if I'm not mistaken, is that there are many things you will not know. and You yes. could not know. So that's that refers back to the last point I made about these these intelligent people. They can't know what's going on everywhere in the world. Something changed. They don't know it. That's why you have to have an exit plan. Yes, always. Um, and then uh, this this one's probably, I'm, I, I know the guys in the room would uh, kick me if I didn't ask you this one. I'm sure it's been beat to death a little bit. But, you know, your, bar your Barron's call. Um, brilliant getting the crash right in 87. Uh, also the mini crash in 89. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if you could elaborate a bit on that, because uh, you use a lot, I use a lot of Dow theory, uh, you use a lot of Dow theory. And what was, what was the Dow theory chart telling you in 87 that really kind of made your mind made up? And then also, um, you kind of stepped on the gas at a certain point. So if you could kind of go over that story a little bit. Well, in that case, in, in 87, the markets had, 
had risen to almost like valuations, not not like today, but close. Mm. You know, they you know, it was the market got overboard, it got overvalued, and there were many subtleties to the to that trade. But firstly, I had made money throughout the year, so I was up. And the the market was hold it. Uh, uh, are you there, Jason? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, I got a, an incoming call. I hit I hit the uh, end button, but I hope I didn't cut you off. Okay. Oh no, you're fine. So, no worries. So anyway, <clears throat> so I was looking for a top. Now Greenspan comes in, and fundamentally, he's starting to raise rates. Mm. Now, if you did that today the world would collapse overnight because everybody yes. knew what raising rates meant. In the earlier day, in the 70s, nobody even knew what the Fed funds rate was. They didn't mm -hmm. know. In the 80s, they were starting to understand that interest rates drove the market to a, to a large degree. So there weren't as many people versed in what interest, rate, interest rates meant. So then you get to the set up in Dow theory where you had a higher high. I can't remember the circumstances exactly, but there was always this divergence. And then there's a sell-off, which happened on a Friday because Monday was the crash. Mm -hmm. And it broke through the lows. Now, I was already short. <clears throat> I added some shorts through puts. And then, you know, by the way, then, then I got lucky because the the real event that killed the market, and again, see, this is an unknown event, and this mm -hmm. people should relate to to what's going on today. Is it's going to be one of these events? James Baker the <clears> third <throat> didn't want. Uh, they they wanted Europe to to raise interest rates. Yeah. So we were coming into the 88 election. He basically threatened over that weekend that if they didn't raise rates, he was going to effectively, he, the words he used was let the dollar slide. That's an exact quote, mm -hmm. which means devaluation. He didn't say how much. That's what really killed the market. But the setup was... You had this overbought market, which like you have now. Yes. You had rising interest rates, which you don't have now. And the Fed said they're not going to do it. I believe they won't raise rates. But mm -hmm. long rates are, are, being, are going up. And that has a slightly negative point. But the key was there was a bit of luck to it when James Baker threatened to devalue the dollar. He didn't say it that way. He said, let the dollar slide. If, if the Germany didn't raise rates... <clears throat> And that's what crushed the markets. So you, so you had a number of issues that were occurring at that time. Part of it was luck. Part, of, Although I think I would have made, see the late Friday sell-off. Mm -hmm. That was before Baker talked. So the key was the market was set up to sell off anyway. And that I would have been right, not to the degree I was. I actually shorted the opening. This is, I rarely do this. Mm -hmm. But the Monday opening, <clears throat> when I heard what he said, now, again, I and I highly suggest that your your traders mm -hmm. use fundamentals as well as they do technicals. Yes, Some people do. weigh one or the other. But mm -hmm. the key was that when I knew when he he said that, uh, that the market was going to was going to take a, a big hit. So I shorted the S&P. These are the these were the. Uh, not the mini futures. These were the original yeah. futures, you know, five hundred dollars a a point. That yeah. and I shorted five of them, just five because I was already short, and I yeah. shorted them down fifteen handles, and I made two hundred fifty thousand on that trade Oof. just because I understood the fundamentals. Yes, you see. So what what paid me on that piece of the puzzle was knowing what it means. If you're going to devalue the dollar suddenly, mm -hmm. which is what Baker was 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 suggesting, so you, you you know if I had to now 
let's say, give some advice here. Please do. The the key is everybody is watching the Fed. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and the Fed the Fed has really turned into something that, that Alan Greenspan should be really criticized for in yeah. teaching these people how to overuse the witch, the wizard's wands, you know, yeah. but, but the key is you sh- sh- everyone should pay much more attention to politics around the world because politics are going to determine Fed actions. So the primary is not the Fed anymore. You know what they're going to do. They tell you everybody knows. Everybody's following the Fed. It's it's going to come from the political end. And I, I, I would say to try to stress, just like that example, really what made me the money was knowing what it meant when James Baker said, I'm going to let the dollar slide. That's made me... 250. Now I made a lot more money. Strangely, I had, you know, these 39 traders. Again, I've been bearish. I told them that they read that Barron's article. Yeah. Half of them lost money. So barely Mm. I made money as a firm and I knew friends that got blown away. So I was happy, but I should have made 10 times the money I made. But you see, these traders did not follow the knowledge they, yes. you know, they didn't follow the knowledge and they didn't follow the disciplines so you know <laughs> it was not it was not a great business the way it was set up but anyway <clears throat> the uh the point is you must follow politics under these conditions because what's going to happen if you look at history and i'm going to give you one other example just to make it concrete, in, in the 60s, and I was watching the markets. I wasn't trading. This is 1962. Mm-hmm. And Kennedy was president. And he basically, the steel companies are raising prices. He basically attacks the steel companies for raising prices, which in that day looked like socialism. In, in, in the minds of the people of that day. Yeah. The market dropped 26% because he interfered with the markets on steel prices. See, that was an unknown thing. Yeah. It, it, it really was not something somebody would have, let's say, made a call on that, mm. you know, he's going to say uh, that steel companies shouldn't raise prices. It was the key there was it was interfering in the marketplace. And the market looked at it as socialism, the beginning of socialism. So it, it tanked 26% in two months. Wow. Just, yeah, just a, Go ahead. No, I was just saying, just, just as an oddball example of why you, you got to expect <clears throat> the unexpected. And it's going to come from politics. Somebody is going to do something or say something. And it's going to affect the markets. Now, what it is, I don't know. No, that's a great point. And, um, you know, I think that's one thing a lot of people don't pay as much attention to, especially now, everybody, especially right now, like you said, it's this whole, oh my God, watch the Fed. The Fed's going to do this tomorrow. You'll control the tomorrow. Everything's going to happen. And, and you know, as I know, is that most likely they're going to warn about it first. They're going to talk about it a little bit. It's not going to, they don't like to surprise the markets. So, right. you know, what you're saying is paying more attention to the outside forces, the unknowns will probably be where one of these come from. Uh, very interesting. Great point there. And so getting yeah, into... And- Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Any anything the Fed does that's subtle, and I'm going to be very honest. This was a critical thing, and I missed it at the time when the Fed was paying res- interest on reserves. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were supposed to start this in 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 2011. They started in October of of 2008, and basically, it was we're going to put a lot of money in the system. And paying money on reserves was paying banks not to loan the money. That's why there's no inflation. Yes. And that's why the velocity of money 
is at 60 year lows and dropping like it's going off a cliff. So the subtleties are to know the rules and the rules are critical when it comes to the fed. You got to look into them. I didn't, I didn't know exactly what that meant. It didn't seem important at the time, but it was critically important because I'm in the commodity business without inflation. I don't make any money. Yeah. Right. So it's important to study these rules and to read a lot. And speaking about inflation and, and commodities. So, you know, the, for me, this last year, based in 2020, we kind of saw the biggest deflationary shock we've seen in a long time. You got bonds had a blow off top on March 9th. You got uh, oil going negative, uh, the front month contract. And basically, ever since, you know, commodities have finally really caught their footing. Um, and I'm a big bull on, on the commodity market at the moment. Uh, you know, I, I know that there's, there's going to be all types of structural errors in between, but we'll see what happens. I was just wondering, what, what are your thoughts why um, commodities finally are starting to perk up, given that the environment uh, is the way it is right now? Well, it, it is obviously the increase in the money supply and the Fed spending, the government spending and fiscal policy mm-hmm. and the, the assumptions of inflation. And there will be inflation. And uh, <clears throat> the key is that, that there's also going to be a slight offset to inflation numbers because they, they rig those numbers, the CPI. Absolutely. And then they also, you, you've got this mortgage and rental issue where they suspended that. So there's going to be an offset, which is deflation in that arena. Once they they say, OK, now you got to start to pay and there'll be lawsuits and a lot of people default. I mean, you go down New York, Madison Avenue, those <laughs> rents are, are 400,000 a year and those stores are boarded up. They're never paying that rent ever. So there's going to be a lot of deflation through the, the mortgage market, through malls and stores that are closing and things like that. And then people are going to default on their mortgages and loans. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit of an offset. But commodities are definitely going up in general. And probably the best, cheapest buy. And, you know, now I have positions here, so I'm talking my book. Mm-hmm. just for the full disclosure, is gold and silver are really the cheapest things you could buy today. You could throw in platinum, but I mean, I'd rather do gold and silver. Mm-hmm. And so to me, that's where one should look. Commodities <clears throat> and primarily gold and silver. If you look at lumber, mm-hmm. classic case, shortages, People buying re- residential housing, commercial, no. Res- residential housing, yes. They move out of the cities, so they're buying and building houses in the country, et cetera, and there's a shortage of lumber, which anybody could have figured it out if you looked, if you were aware, but then you had to go buy the lumber futures. You see what I mean? Yeah. And they, that's why I say you got to look to commodities because the lumber futures are up from 200 to 1,000. Uh, see what I got on my machine here, my memory. But it was pretty substantial, and a lot of money could have been made. And, uh, yeah, yeah. well, let's call it 400 to 1326. Yes. From, from uh, October. <laughs> it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Huge. Just yeah. crazy. Uh, yeah, and actually, we, we I, myself at least, uh, you know, I put out my, everybody in the room knows my book, but I have a lumber trade on, have had two, two lumber trades, this, this uh, one in 2020 and one this year. And, you know, I would have never dreamed in a million years where it where ended up, uh, but man, happy with it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's the commodities market is really to I and and that's another thing I've been talking about a lot is you know a lot of people kind of shy away from futures, and I really think that you know the, the next 
10 years, it's something that people really kind of need to understand if you are a serious trader. Granted, you know, there's leverage, you can get blown out, you got to be real strict on your risk control and stuff. But you really want to be able to look at those markets buy those markets, because there's a lot of opportunities in the commodity space. Um, and besides the commodity space, are you seeing any opportunities uh, in the markets, which is, you know, kind of almost funny, because there's, there's, there's always an opportunity, but it's, it's getting a little frothy at the moment. I love the yeah. I love gold and gold miners right now, but besides those, yeah the 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 stock market generally is so overpriced. I mean, I see numbers in the forties PE. Yeah. So I I I, I just don't I, you can't short it mm -hmm. because it's a runaway train. But the value is not there. See, I could buy silver and gold and forget about it. You know, yes. I don't need to worry. It's an investment concept. And I believe silver will be 50 this year and gold will be 23 to 2400. And so that's my mentality, right? So that's the way I think. And by the way, before I forget, Jason, if you send me, and I probably have it, but I'm just repeating it, send me your email because I just wrote a piece on gold versus Bitcoin. Oh, and I, I wrote it on Sunday. It came out. I write through this guy called the curmudgeon. Mm -hmm. If you look, when you see it, you'll you have many pieces written in there. Oh, cool. Because when I want to write something, he's a great editor. Mm -hmm. And he's had this since the 90s. And he basically write, prints anything I say. Now, he edits it a bit. And I really don't care as long as he sticks within the topic. In this case, he, he did. Mm -hmm. But I'll send it to you because it, it, it is a, an interesting piece. Beautiful. Yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see that. Uh, that that's one we're kind of where we're at uh, right now is, um, you know, we're, we're kind of in that home run mode type of situation at the moment. And now I'm putting on certain trades, uh, which is, it's all gold, because basically all I'm seeing is the same thing is right now you have gold miners, silver, gold at this great zone at the moment uh fundamentally technically the any way you look at it it's a beautiful buy right now especially while everybody's kind of running into this whole bitcoin is taking over the world type of scenario which isn't true but you know that's how markets are you know falsehoods and lies as, as you've quoted before yeah, um yeah. so so last question is basically you're you speak very eloquently and if anybody uh hasn't seen this you know make sure to check out your your uh, views on hyperinflation you have video on that uh, right moving towards you know we have all obviously like you're saying we're going to have these ebbs and flows and but uh, over the long term uh do you still see the hyperinflation scenario playing out yeah i'm going to give you a, a definite clue because i've sort of written an update now when i when i first did that piece mm -hmm. I basically said hyper, hyperinflation, a statistical inevitability. I never called when. Yes. Because that is a psychological process. Yes, it's possible. I know. only know that the end game mm -hmm. from the government is hyperinflation. If you had hyperinflation, which, you know, is defined by this guy, Phil Kagan, as 50% a month is hyperinflation. CPI, 50% a month. Four months, you'd knock off 94% of the debt. Four yes. months. So they can't default. They're never going to default. So anybody who thinks bankruptcy, they just have no concept of how governments work. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let long-term capital default. I mean, they're not going to let the government default. No, The nothing. key is yeah. the end game is hyperinflation. Okay? Because it's quick. Mm -hmm. Like I say, four months. Anybody can live through four months of anything, right? Yeah. So they'll wipe out. I mean, it'll be a disaster for a lot of people, but that's the end game. Now, when does that happen? I've filtered this down a bit to when mo modern monetary theory kicks in. It's all over Biden's plan. Stephanie Kelton has you know, she's all over their manifesto of for the, the Democratic platform. Yes. And so when they give you a thousand to two thousand a month to the bulk of the 
nation under 18, which about 270 million people-ish, you'll get your hyperinflation. The reason you haven't gotten it is because if you give money to Bill Gates, he, what difference does it make? He'll just buy another company or invest it somewhere. He's not going to go out and spend it. You get hyperinflation through the turnover of money, through velocity, because people are spending it because they don't want the currency. But yes. if you own stocks, stocks, if you look at Venezuela, they should do okay. And therefore, when you give money through QE, which is where a great deal of the money supply growth come, came from, and you get no inflation, it's because you're giving it to the people who don't spend the money. They invest the money. So where is the inflation per se or the price increases come from, from inflation, the inflation is printing the money, the price increases are the result, they go into housing and, and, uh, and, and the stock market. You know, that's basically yes. where it went. Beautiful. So said. hyperinflation will come when they give it to the people. And, and that's kind of already started a little bit, you know, and it's right. uh, it's we're moving that direction. And, and I, I completely agree uh, with that uh, thought. And I know a lot of people, you know, they're, they're on the fence about it. But it's like, you know, we we we've kind of to me, we've seen that almost psychological shift where not that I don't I do. I'll never know the exact timing, of course. But we kind of were seeing that psychological shift where we are starting to see that inflation coming in. People, uh, you know, once again, everybody's still not admitting it's, it's happening. You know, commodities are going to fall apart any day now is what they're all saying. But it's it's very interesting. And and yeah, once again, I would like uh, people to definitely check out your thing on hyperinflation. That was really good. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, one, we always uh, ask one one more question, which is if you were to give any advice to uh, some of the younger, newer traders in the group, um, what would you say to them? Well, the, the basics are pay mo more attention to the technicals at this point because they will, they're more honest. If you buy at 50 and you sell at 49, you can lose a hundred dollars. You know, you, you've got your, your system set where you can't go out of business, yep. but you've got to learn more about the what fiscal policies are going to do to the future of the U.S. Mm -hmm. That that's where I think people they look at the Fed, but like a magician, you know, is telling you look at my right hand and the left hand is is what counts. So uh, I'm only saying that you, you, you study the fundamentals of government and the history of governments. But pay most attention to the technicals because they're going to keep you in business. Don't worry about the whip source. Okay, that that would be my advice to new people. Great, that was that was spot on. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you've been a big inspiration for me over all these years of trading. Uh, it's a, it's been a blast to get to talk to you for a bit. Uh, thank you so much for all the great advice. And well, a I, pleasure to meet you.